The Missing, JJ Macfield and the Island of Memories is a 2.5D puzzle platformer game developed by White Owls. Its writer and director Hidetaka Suahiro, or Sueri as he is more commonly known as, has a reputation of making weird games, and I've gotten the impression that most of his titles have not impressed people that much on a technical level, but possess a lot of unique charm that has gained a cult following for his titles over the years. I'm not personally too familiar with Sueri's games, and only know his work from Deadly Premonition. And to be quite honest, The Missing only ended up on my radar because the game is published by Arc System Works the company behind Guild Gear. This video will be divided into two parts. First I will give my spoiler-free review of The Missing in a regular review format, and after that is done I will dive deeper into the themes and the story of the game, with the analysis portion in the latter half of the video. The basic premise of The Missing goes as follows. JJ and Emily travel on a camping trip to Memoria Island, that's located just off the coast of Maine. Emily goes missing and JJ ventures deeper into the island to look for her when strange things start happening. What was that? There are just a few moments in the game where the 2.5D setting of the game comes into play in a gameplay sense. Like when crawling beside boxes you need to later push to solve a puzzle, or when you're interacting with something that's a bit on the background. But mostly the missing functions like a side scroll in 2D game. In terms of controls, the missing is nothing out of the ordinary when it comes to platformers. You have a button for jumping, interacting with objects, and a button for crouch and crawl. There's one more button dedicated to the special gameplay mechanic that sets it apart from every other platformer game out there. In this game you'll play as JJ, and the funny thing about her is that she cannot die. Well, she can, but it'll take quite a bit of damage for her to reach that point. This means that she can get her limbs ripped off, neck snapped and set on fire and she's still going. Even when she's just a severed head, she'll keep on going. This special power of JJ is used for most of the puzzles in the game. For example, you might need to sever your arm to use it as a projectile to hit things that are out of reach. You might need to set yourself on fire to illuminate the dark areas, or reduce yourself into just a rolling head to fit the places that are too small for you to fit in. There are also sections in the game that reminded me a lot of Playdead's titles like Limbo or Inside, where you need to snap your neck to flip the screen upside down to solve certain puzzles. Your movement options will change depending on what injuries you've taken, and certain actions are not possible when under certain injuries. When on fire, you will run in panic for a bit unable to stop and cannot fall long distances without breaking your body apart. When your arm has been severed, you cannot hold on to ropes and so on. In all its absurdity, it all feels rather logical to the player in a gameplay sense, and only takes a bit of trial and error to grasp what your options are in these different states of injury. Unfortunately, the controls in the game are rather clunky. While some of it is definitely intentional and probably aimed to make the player feel the injuries that JJ suffers, making it feel more realistic so to speak, the bottom line is that it feels bad to play at times, and that's not a good thing. The movement feels very weighty, for example turning around while crouching is super slow, and even entering and exiting crouching takes unnecessarily long time to do. Something I personally hate is when a game doesn't have air control and it ends up affecting the gameplay feel. If the game lacks it, it better be designed in a way that it makes sense. 
For example, this part where you can climb a rope and try to do something as simple as land on the train roof below. So the spots you would like to land are either here or here. But the total lack of air control and how the jump distance is set in the game just results to you jumping here. What the fuck, man? In the missing you only have air control when you are rolling head, but even then it feels off sometimes, resulting to jumps being easily overextended, but not easily correctable despite the ability to air control JJ. Then we get here, and we're gonna touch the water, so let's see if I fucked this up or not. I did. <laughs> Fuck my life. <laughs> However, I do like the fact that the rolling head sticks to the walls a bit in certain sections, making the movement feel better. While I think auto grabbing the ledges is a good decision for gameplay feel, even that can lead to JJ sometimes doing odd things like this. This has more to do with how the levels are designed and how it sometimes doesn't match the gameplay though. Action button also doubles as something I like to call the shout button. Meaning that if you push the action button when there's nothing to interact with, it will result to JJ shouting something like While this is funny at first, sometimes the game doesn't seem to recognize whether you want to interact with something or shout for Emily for a millionth time. Emily, where are you? Woohoo! This, doubled with the clunky movement, can result to a frustration cocktail that I know will get to some players' nerves. Even JJ's basic movement speed seems a bit too slow. I especially noticed this after finishing the game once and unlocking the movement speed booster cheat that makes the game feel so much better to play, even if it doesn't affect the platforming in any way. You will no doubt get used to the controls in time, but it's always a bad feeling when you think the game's unresponsiveness led to your failure. Luckily, the game runs well and all my playthroughs of the game have been completely free of bugs. Unfortunately, I haven't even mentioned the worst thing about the game yet, which is the horrible checkpoints in the game. The puzzles tend to be somewhat lengthy in the game, and while you're able to regain your body with the press of a button, if you think you've messed something up, and that way soft restarting the puzzles, certain puzzles in the game include parts where you are forced to take risks that when failed will lead to your death, sending you back to the very beginning of the level. This alone can be frustrating, but sometimes the checkpoints are designed in a way that failure sets you behind a lengthy, unskippable cutscene or a phone conversation you need to go through every single time you die, completely breaking the flow of the game. The sometimes clunky controls and the horrible checkpoints aside, I really like the most of the puzzles in the game. The puzzles have nice variety, and the unique injury mechanic offers some cool moments to the gameplay. Although, I think some of the tricks in the game are played a bit too many times. For example, this hand grabbing you through the door can be surprising on the first time, but on the second and third time it's just a too lengthy moment drained out of its original tension and offers nothing new to the experience. Another weird thing about the game was these little dialogue prompts where you have to press down a button for JJ to say something that are completely unnecessary. This happened during gameplay cutscenes where the control is taken away from the player, so the only option to do here, gameplay-wise, was just to push the button that the game tells you to. So what is the point of having it there? Couldn't the cutscene just roll on its own? My first thought when I entered scenes like this in the game was that, aha, this is probably a way to trigger a secret outcome if you do not press the button here, but wait instead. And so I waited, and waited, and nothing happened. There's a tiny possibility that these scenes serve some purpose, but for now I sure as hell haven't figured what that something is. These are like quick time events without fail state or timing. However, the game is not completely without secrets, and sharp-eyed players that are able to solve some of the more tricky optional puzzles are rewarded with more hidden collectibles that will unlock extra costumes, artwork, and most importantly, new details of the story in a form of text messages that JJ receives to her phone. Aesthetically, The Missing is a very mixed bag as well. While the art made for all these different emoticons in the phone conversations are great, the visuals during the gameplay segments can be very inconsistent. The character models and their animations are fine for the most part, 
but the holy hell kind of backgrounds look bland and dated at times. There are sections in the game that actually look really nice, but there are way more of those areas that look bland, uninspired and undetailed. This is probably not as big of an issue if you're playing this game on the small handheld screen of Nintendo Switch, but when the game is blown up on a decently sized PC screen, it's impossible not to notice some of the ugliest parts of the game. I can easily look past the graphical fidelity of the game if a strong art style is there, but the missing completely lacks both at times. Music is used very sparingly in the game, but when it's there, it's really great. Rhyming from pleasant emotional vocal pieces to relaxing jazzy lounge tunes. The bone cracks and neck snaps you'll hear a lot in the game are fittingly crunchy, but I think they could have recorded a couple of more extra screams for JJ, since you hear a lot of repetition here when hurting yourself. When it comes to voice acting, well, it's bad. There's no other way to say it. Nah. No, you oh, always say that. Really? Oh, oh no. Nah. Oh my gosh. Oh. Oh, stop it. Some might consider the voice acting to be charming in all its wonkiness, but I don't think it's charismatic enough to be really considered anything but bad. Kinda like my commentary. Luckily there's not much voice acting in the game and much of it is delivered in a uh, Twin Peaks style reverse talk, which doesn't sound as bad as the um, regular speech and actually makes some characters sound rather cute. My pure hemorrhage. My pure hemorrhage. My pure hemorrhage. It sort of pains me to say this about something that I felt was overall very special experience to me, but when it comes to the gameplay and presentation of the missing, it reminds me of many games. It has cool puzzles that remind me of Limbo and Inside, some of its visual aspects flirt with games like Persona, and the clunky platforming brings back memories of the early Tomb Raider games. However, as I said, despite all of this, the missing manages to deliver a pretty unique experience when all of this is combined, and in the end I do think it's a better game than the sum of its parts. A lot of that has to do with the game's story, but in order for me to explain myself further, I need to dive into the spoiler territory now when we enter the analysis part of this video. The surface level story of the missing is JJ trying to find Emily that goes missing during the camping trip to Memoria Island. But while the game progresses, it quickly becomes apparent that it's not what the game is really about. The game even opens up with the text. This game was made with the belief that no one is wrong for being what they are. How this manifests itself in the game is what we're here to analyze, and in order to really do that, I have to give out the biggest reveal of the game right at the start here, so I can talk about the things that relate to it better. In the end of the game, we are revealed that the whole game we go through is a near-death dream JJ has after attempted suicide, where she struggles to find and accept herself for who she is. There are multiple clues for JJ being in a near-death state, the most obvious one being the Moose Doctor character that appears throughout the game, repeating lines like Shucks, didn't death. Major hemorrhage. How many am I in all something you would hear said by a medic when someone is being revived. The is most likely the sound of defibrillator. However, what isn't quite that apparent in the early game is the secret JJ has hidden from almost everyone. She is a trans woman. This and most other things about the game's overarching themes are revealed through the text messages that JJ receives to her phone from the following people. Her classmates, Abby, Philip and Lily, her professor, Derek Goodman, her stuffed animal, FK, her mom and Emily. These text message conversations pop up on JJ's phone while she gathers donut collectibles in the game. 
so in order to get the full picture of the story, you have to get all of them. So let's talk about the text messages and what we learn from them, one character at a time. Mom. JJ has moved away from home to enter a university. During this, she also transitions from male to female. Now that she is away from the watching eye of her mother, who doesn't know JJ's secret. The only names pinned on JJ's phone are Mom and Emily, the only people she had met prior to her arrival to the university. From the text conversations between JJ and her mother, we learn that her mother is very controlling towards her and has very strict expectations set for her future, all the way from jobs to her diet and even doing a background check on Professor Goodman. She is also deeply religious and even specifically mentions that she is very glad that JJ grew up to be normal. In one of the conversations we find out that JJ's father is dead. Now, this was never specifically said in the game and I'm not sure about it, but I think JJ's father might have died in the same accident her mother was in not too long ago. Details of the accident and the aftermath of it remain a mystery, but maybe losing her husband caused this overly controlling and protecting nature in JJ's mother, since she has an obsession of being perfect. And now JJ is the only one she has, so she's willing to do anything to make her grow up exactly as she sees ideal. One day, against JJ's wishes, her mother decides to clean her old room and find some girl's clothes there, which makes her suspicious and she confronts JJ about it. JJ tells her that they are just clothes Emily left there when she was visiting. But due to her curious nature, JJ's mom later reads through her old diary, finding out her secret. She doesn't seem to be outright mad at JJ, but thinks that she is mentally unstable and immediately schedules a psychiatric counseling in order to fix her. Later on, JJ does visit the psychiatric counselor with her mother, and her mom is thrilled about this, celebrating how well it went. Of course, as usual, she is being ignorant, thinking more about herself here, and things don't end up that well for JJ. There's two letters JJ wrote to her mom that can be found on this Twitter account created for her. In the first one, she does tell her that it hurts to hear her mom call her sick. Despite all of this, it's clear that JJ's mom does love her, and vice versa. But maybe due to this controlling nature of her mother's love, she is very careful of using the word love with other people. You love this kind of stuff, don't you? I certainly don't hate it. Emily. Emily is JJ's best friend and it's suggested by the game that they are a bit more than that as well, in some level at least. Emily is always very supportive and accepts JJ for who she is, even after she told her secret to her. Most of the conversations between Emily and JJ are about food and traveling, which they both seem to love. In one of the conversations, JJ mentions that she would like to travel to Thailand. She says it's because she wants to ride a tuk-tuk, but it could also be perhaps because of the ladyboy culture there. Emily asks JJ what she wants for her birthday and JJ answers, time. This probably means that she needs more time to find who she is in this life that moves too fast, or that the world needs more time to accept her for who she is. Emily also has a secret of her own that she told JJ. What this secret was is never deliberately revealed to the player, but my bet is that it's the fact that she's in the girls. Now, something that is really interesting here is the point and the reason of JJ finding out herself being a trans woman. From all the conversations in the game, we find out that JJ wants to please everyone, and always puts the needs of others ahead of her own, while clearly struggling with her own identity and what she wants from life, telling different people different things, but accepting nothing less than perfection. So it's possible that after JJ heard that Emily is not in the boys, she wanted to please her so much that she actually transitioned into a woman for her, so they could be together while in reality JJ might feel that she is completely genderless. It's also possible that they just exchanged secrets at the clock tower, Emily revealing that she is in the girls and JJ telling her that she is a trans woman. 
But Emily does seem to feel some sort of guilt from what happened at the clock tower, so that would support the theory that JJ transitioned for her, because she's just in general unsure about herself in every way possible. There's more things about Emily in the game that I'd like to talk about, but I'll come back to that a bit later on. Not me. Abigail is a very impulsive and rebellious schoolmate of JJ who plays in a rock band and slacks off in school. JJ seems to like her since she's almost the exact opposite of her in her seemingly careless attitude towards other people. JJ wants to please other people, while Abigail doesn't seem to care at all what other people think of her. Abigail also seems to admire JJ for how smart she is, and often asks help from JJ with her studies. When JJ tells Abigail that she is jealous of her because she doesn't let anyone tell her what to do, Abigail tells her that JJ can also just dye her hair and get some more piercings and she'll be just like her. JJ goes silent after this, probably realizing that no matter what she does to her appearance, her real problem is that she doesn't really know what she wants. One of the most interesting things that happen in the texts between JJ and Abigail is when JJ tells her about the school assignment where they need to go to talk to someone who they find hard to get along with, and summarize their experience in an essay. When Abigail asks who JJ is going to talk with, she just answers that it's a secret. Why this is so intriguing for me is that the person JJ uses for the essay could on some level be any one of the people she talks to in the game, and we never get to know who it is. Philip is a schoolmate of JJ that she doesn't seem to be that close friends with, but is still somewhat friendly with him. Philip is from a rich family, slacks off in school and often asks JJ's help to either do his homework for him or to watch the videos that he creates. He seems incredibly spoiled and insensitive, but in the end he just wants to be accepted and chases his dream to be an actor despite his obvious lack of natural talent. This is something that is possible due to his supporting parents and a clear goal that he has decided to pursue in life. A luxury JJ doesn't have. Lily. Lily is another one of JJ's schoolmates who obviously has a crush on her and is a cat lover. Most of the conversations between Lily and JJ are Lily's subtle or not so subtle attempts to flirt and fangirl over JJ. However, she doesn't get JJ's interest in any romantic way. A rather funny thing that happens in the conversations with Lily is when she tells a story that she saw someone bullying a cat with their umbrella, when a woman with nose piercing came and broke the umbrella and chased off the bully. In an earlier conversation, JJ tells Philip that he would get more views to his videos if he would get a cat, since everyone loves cats. So this was obviously Philip trying to get cat footage for his video, and Abigail was the one stopping it. I'm calling it now, this scene will play out in the next swear game, The Good Life. Okay, it probably will not, but would that be cool? Henry Dreyfus is mentioned in one of the conversations between Lily and JJ. This is an interesting detail because he was an industrial designer who committed suicide with his wife and also wrote about the metrics of male and female body. In one of the conversations we learn how FK, JJ's stuffed animal got chewed up by her grandpa's dog. In the same conversation JJ mentions that animals do not like her. I guess this is the remnants of dogs supposed to make an appearance in the game hinted by this artwork that you can unlock but for some reason they are nowhere to be seen in the final game. Lily is the reason why the people at JJ's new school get to know about her secret. She sees JJ borrowing a book from the library about her condition and talks to some people at school about it, obviously causing rumors to spread. Unfortunately, Lily doesn't seem to understand what JJ is going through that well and just tells JJ that's not who she is and calls it weird, not realizing that JJ has already made up her mind. Or has she? We get to that a little bit later. Professor Derek Goodman is JJ's professor at the university, and I get the feeling that sometimes JJ sees him as somewhat of a father figure. Through the conversations between Professor Goodman and JJ, we can see how JJ's mental issues start to take the toll on her studies well. 
When Professor asks JJ what got her into studying product design, she tells him that she likes antiques and trinkets, especially clocks, since she believes that there's enough unique designs for everyone to have their own. This probably tells of her desire to find her own place in the world, and maybe for her the clocks act as symbol of having more time. This also hints that it was probably JJ who stole Philip's clock that went missing at one point. She also openly admits to Professor Goodman that she has no idea what kind of dreams and goals she has for the future. Professor Goodman is all around supporting when it comes to JJ and grants her with a lot of words of wisdom and understanding even after he finds out JJ's secrets, probably because he went through similar issues when he was a student. However, some of the criticisms he gives for her assignments clashes with JJ's problems, like how he says that form follows function. Something that when you think about it, isn't all that accurate to JJ's body. This conversation could also be interpreted as a statement that there's more to a person than just the metrics of their body, since Professor mentions that life habits and daily use should also be factored into the design of the product. Kinda like life and time changes us as people. In one of the conversations where JJ admits that she has never seen any Star Wars films, Professor, who is a huge fan of the series and got into product design directly because of it, gives a huge speech about how every intricate detail was given care and backstory in the films. Now, I've understood this as a hint for the players to also pay attention to details about the missing, not just the most obvious things, which is exactly what we're doing with this analysis, because a lot of small details can be easily missed with this game. FK is JJ's stuffed animal who magically starts sending her text messages. I would assume that the conversations with FK are the only ones that will only happen in the dream that JJ experiences near death and didn't happen in reality like all the other text messages you get in the game. What FK says in these messages is mostly just random stuff like spamming emotes, but there are a couple of interesting things in these conversations as well. To get all of these messages, you'll have to play through the game again after your first playthrough and find FK hidden in the levels. For example, we are revealed that Emily and JJ didn't seem to like each other that much at first, but somehow became best friends anyway. This is probably a way to tell the player that first impressions aren't always everything, and the differences can be the thing that makes them a perfect match and need each other. This also comes up in other conversations like when Professor Goodman talks about his wife, who doesn't like his hobbies, but still accepts him for who he is. In the last conversation with FK, they want to know what kind of creature they were before. JJ answers that she doesn't remember anymore and doesn't give a shit because she likes FK the way they are now. FK is stitched together from many different stuffed animal parts, so it's impossible to say what exactly they are or were. The question here is, does it matter? And why? When enough time passes, we tend to forget superficial things like that. These characters JJ texts with in the game all have secrets or problems they are keeping from other people, just like JJ. Her mom's obsessive need to be perfect, Emily and Lily being into girls, Abigail trying to be accepted through her music and not being judged by her looks, Philip having all the support and money in the world but still wanting his dreams taken seriously, and Professor Goodman for hiding the fact that he skips some work days for his hobbies. Everyone have their struggles and no one in this world is without problems, no matter what their sexual orientation, financial situation, values or dreams might be. and 
JJ's struggles in this dream world she goes through in the game also has some details that hint to the overarching themes of the game. I haven't been able to find anything worthwhile to point out from all of the areas, but here are some of the details that I think are interesting. In the waste treatment area you can see these steam cans all around. In one of the conversations with Lily, she specifically mentions that she would like to stuff someone she hates into an oil can and push them into the sea. So maybe these oil cans represent the people JJ hates or wants out of her life. There's quite a lot of them. The Franklin Rose Church is obviously a manifestation of JJ's struggles with her highly religious upbringing. There's owls in this church, but unlike white owls we see guiding us earlier in the game, there's also red-eyed owls here that when startled will attack JJ. White owls could be a little cameo of the developers of the game, after all they are called white owls, but this could also symbolize JJ's distrust in people since no matter how they look, it's impossible to know if they would understand and judge her. The red-eyed owls could also represent her fear of God, or just another Twin Peaks reference. The owls are not what they seem. After solving the puzzle in the church, we get our first chase sequence with a creature called the Hair Shrieker. <laughs> it's a long haired creature that is armed with a box cutter. Even though I cannot read Japanese so I would know what the text next to the artwork say, my understanding is that this creature had a couple of different designs before the devs ended up on the final look of it. These earlier designs seemed to be a lot more heavy on the religious themes and the creature looked more human, wore nun's clothing and wasn't armed with a box cutter but instead used some kind of a cleaver. It's possible that this was just another cut enemy design that wasn't even meant to be the same creature as the hair shrieker, so maybe if there's someone there watching this video who knows Japanese, I would be interested in knowing what the notes say about the artworks. The hair shrieker is a physical manifestation of JJ's suicidal tendencies and her fears of everyone seeing her as a freak. After all, the creature looks somewhat similar to the pictures of the fake account that was created of JJ when her secret of being trans got out to the public. This creature relentlessly chases after JJ, just like mental struggles follow us no matter where we go. It's hard to escape something that is in your head. In the ending sequence, JJ needs to defeat this creature that her mind has created in order to be reborn, accept herself and not give in to the temptation of giving up. In the graveyard section, JJ needs to put bodies into open graves to proceed. This could represent the moment in her life when she had to bury her own father in order to move on with her life. It could also symbolize JJ's want to bury her male body away. At the graveyard is the first time we see the twisted baby monsters that will grab JJ and split her to pieces. These babies will probably represent JJ's fear of how her mother sees her as some sort of a twisted version of what should be normal. Her mother does say that she considers JJ as her baby, and the music box tune that alarms the players that one of these baby monsters is lurking nearby is simply called Mother. While solving the puzzle to get all the body parts in one of the graves, JJ runs into this moose-headed Vitruvian man statue. This is probably another manifestation of JJ's fear of her body not meeting the ideal metrics of female, but a male. There's not much I could figure out about Garland lumber mill area, but the whole section with all these shredders could be a metaphor of JJ considering herself as dead wood so to speak, something already dead and expendable. All the shredders could also hint at her views on meat production, since she does mention that she is a vegetarian. The game does like to ask deep questions like what it means to live, do trees live, and are they less valuable than animals or even humans? It's all a matter of perspective. So maybe the lumber mill section is the manifestation of Chichi's struggle with this thought. Where one just sees wood being chopped up for lumber, some could see living things being shredded here. At the graveyard the trees are withering away as well and there's burned wood on some of the graves, so that detail could be intentional. 
At the Merrill Railroad, JJ gets run over by a train. In one of the conversations with FK, JJ mentions the industrial designer Henry Dreyfus again, who made iconic designs for trains and vacuums for example, and says that she wants to design something retro in the future, something that loops around and becomes cutting edge. FK asks if she wants to design donuts, because those loop around as well. In her texts with Philip, she says that she wants to become a world-class baker. The train running over her probably symbolizes her fears of failing at her studies, or inability to make her dreams come true. At the Gehenna Rock Bridge, we can see Emily running away from us. This is the first hint at the fact that there's something odd about Emily in this dream world. She asks you if this is her dream or JJ's dream. Now, how I have understood Emily's appearances outside of her text messages with JJ is that she's a reflection of JJ herself in a way or a symbol of hope and acceptance in JJ's mind. After all, Emily was the only person who fully accepts her. So in this dream world, she chases after Emily, away from her fears and doubts. The reason for Emily's dialogue being reversed in the dream world is probably because this is JJ talking to herself more than anything else. Hey Joel, my message It's been so Emily? Where are you? Nearby. Meaning where? Why are you running from me? I guess I should just go start the jumping. <laughs> no! Stop being stupid. But if I go on living, Ranzos keep causing trouble for people. I thought they don't be fine if my shit are you, you know? Emily! Hold on. Hey, JJ. I have rich range now. I feel a lot lighter. I'll be right there. Just wait for me. Okay, Emily. Glad wing. Glad fun wing. Emily asking JJ if this is her dream or JJ's could be the struggle inside JJ's head of whether she transitioned for Emily or for herself. However, this is something that I'm very hesitant on and might be missing something here. After the bridge collapses between JJ and Emily, JJ falls down the road 65, an area where we meet these creepy monkey creatures. I've thought about these creatures a lot and the possible symbolism behind them, but I cannot come up with anything solid. There's some significance for all these monkeys to swear for sure, but the only thing I could find was the tweet on JJ's Twitter where she mentions that these toys scared her when she was a child. So it's probably just another manifestation of JJ's fears like so many other things in the game are. There's a tiny fun detail at the little shrimp diner area. There's a man lift there where it reads CO name here. It could be that the devs didn't notice this and this is just a placeholder text that slipped past the development all the way to the final game, but I think it's way more likely that this is another sign of this being a dream world in JJ's head. The company name of the man lift is missing either because JJ doesn't know any companies that manufacture lifts in real life, or maybe it is a small memory of some of her school assignments on product design, where she needed to name the company that designed this model. There's a couple of notes here that mainly work as hint for the puzzles and unfortunately I wasn't able to make any connections of the people mentioned here and how they relate to JJ except for Paul Dutch's brother also being a good listener like JJ but also pretty likely ended up committing suicide. The rabbit bowling area is visually my favorite area of the game and it also includes my favorite puzzle in the game. In here, you need to solve a puzzle where different athletes are disguised doing something out of their character. An astronaut is a coal keeper, jet pilot is playing American football and pizza delivery guy is playing baseball. This is another way of the game telling us that what you look like doesn't necessarily tell anything about you. The final touch on this puzzle is the missing shoe of the basketball player, the only one who is doing what you'd expect of them. There's always something missing. There's a couple of areas after rabbit bowling, but I have nothing worthwhile to say about them until JJ arrives at the Matthew King clock tower. This is the place where Emily and JJ shared secrets. But here, Emily is acting really strange again. 
Hi, Trina. Come and see her. Emily! Emily! She seems to really confused. Mommy, thank God. Inside and outside. These, again, to me, sound more like Cheche's thoughts in her head rather than Emily talking to her. Why not something feeling real? What does it mean to be human? What does that mean? Some questions that are quite impossible to answer, don't you think? This asks, how important is one's genitals anyway? This either is the final confirmation that JJ is really talking to herself here, or alternatively asks a question of can we be something just because we say so, and if not, what makes it true or not true? JJ eventually makes her way to the top of the clock tower, where we can find JJ's own suicide note. In the message, she says she's going to put on her blood red wings that will make her fly far away. This is obviously hinting at her cut wrists. This is the point of the game where JJ finally faces her worst fears in life. She finds that Emily committed suicide by hanging herself, and after arguing with FK for a bit on the phone, JJ also hangs herself. The text on the screen says that 100 years have passed, and finally Cheche's rope snaps making her drop down to her school. Here she slowly walks through the school living against the bullying and judgement of other students in her new freakish form. This whole section is about Cheche's fear that not any amount of time, not even 100 years would make people to understand her. 
Remember, all she wanted for her birthday was time. When JJ finally ends up on the school roof, Emily is there shooting her with a shotgun. By the way, as a side note here, maybe these two went on a shooting range together at some point, since in these ghostly memories that we see near the start of the game, it looks like they are learning how to handle guns, or is it just me? This is JJ's worst fear, the fear that Emily would hate her even after her death for not keeping the promise that she made with her to be together forever. This causes JJ to completely be consumed by her fear and self-hatred and transform into this creature. Eventually, JJ devours Emily and the final conversation with FK reveals what has been going on. JJ is dead, and it has all been a dream inside JJ's head. Somehow JJ still finds the strength to push through the darkness like a superhero. I won't lose again. I'm ready to accept myself now. My mind is so clear. As clear as a crisp spring morning. Will commit suicide as well. JJ is able to defeat the physical manifestation of her suicidal tendencies, the hair shrieker. In this section, JJ automatically heals herself while she gets hit because she has already won the mental struggle against it, thus being invincible against it. After the fight, we get a scene of JJ running through a meadow from where a whale can be seen swimming on the sky in the background. Some might be wondering what this whale has to do with anything, so after some googling I found out that the whales symbolize things like physical and emotional healing, emotional rebirth and importance of family and community. All quite fitting for the game's themes. Did you find what you were looking for? You better not lose it again. Don't move just yet. What do you see? A deer. <sighs> Good. You're gonna be okay, but we're gonna give you a bit more blood just in case. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Let me show you the little guy who saved you. He's the one who stopped your bleeding. FK. Mom. Yeah, I'm fine. I... 
Um, I don't know how to say it. Huh? Stop crying, or I won't be able to understand you. Yeah. I love you too. JJ! Emily! You idiot! Emily, that hurts. Shut up! I was worried to death! <laughs> I thought you were gone forever. <laughs> Emily, I had a strange dream. You were in it too. A bad dream? Yeah. But I needed it. It helped me find what I was looking for. Emily, thank you for always supporting me. I think... I finally understand who I am now. I'll never leave you again. JJ! <laughs> Me neither. Emily, I told you. That hurts. Shut up! No more talking! <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know what you might be thinking, we see JJ in her more masculine appearance in the ending, so doesn't that mean that she never did go through a transition before her suicide attempt took place? And yes, this could very well be the case. I was in the belief for a long time that JJ had started her new life by going through her transition to a woman, and maybe wore a wig when she entered the new school, and tried to commit suicide in her more masculine appearance to look how all the people wanted her to look when her secret cut out. But then again, the version we see of her in the dream world is most likely how JJ sees herself. Even her voice is different. That also explains the whole turning into a monster thing that might confuse people in the end of the game. That's just how JJ sees herself on her moment of despair. A freak. A monster. When you get called something long enough, you might start to believe it yourself. Maybe there's even some symbolism behind the whole losing body parts mechanic in the game. JJ will be fine as long as she doesn't lose her head. Whether JJ did or did not go through her transition before her suicide attempt doesn't matter that much for the overall picture, but it would fit to her regeneration story of accepting who she is and wants to be after she is brought back to life. Even the post clear JJ you get to play as as the shorter hair she has on the ending scene. FK stopped JJ's bleeding and the medic was seen as a moose-headed doctor because JJ's near-death state of mind blended the moose head from the wall with the doctor trying to keep her awake. And that ends my analysis of the missing. Some of the things in the game are perhaps underlined a bit too heavily while others I still cannot figure out. Like what all the areas represent in JJ's mind, what Emily really represents in the game, why some of the conversations with FK are so bizarre, or why some of the characters in the game share the same names with characters from Swery's earlier games. Maybe the mystery is a part of the beauty of it, so there's room for different interpretations of what some of the things in the game might mean. I bet different people can experience this game's themes very differently, and maybe that's exactly the reason why the questions presented in the game are there for. The game is not about JJ trying to find Emily. It's about JJ finding herself. The game is for all the people who have struggled to find themselves and what their purpose is in life. And while The Missing might not be a perfect gameplay experience all the time, the message of the game is definitely something I can stand behind. No one is wrong for being what they are. We all have something missing. We just have to find it. Thank you so much for watching and take care.